Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hope you had another good week. I think I did. It went by so fast, can't hardly remember it. But it's time to praise the Lord for his goodness, his mercy, his love, whatever else you think about. Welcome back, John and Linda. We missed you. Yes. Don't be gone so long. <laughs> Although I did hear that you have a guest speaker coming in next week. We'll have to come back next week to see who that is. Ah. And tonight, I always forget, we do have Bible study at 6 o'clock right here. We're starting a new book, Daniel. We did Revelation a while back, and Daniel will dovetail right into it. So we invite everybody that is interested in Bible study back here at 6. And as people keep coming in, let's be thinking about what we're going to praise the Lord for. Calvin, what are you thankful for? I woke up this morning. I think you might say that. <laughs> Anything else? I'm, I'm very happy. You know, the life I have, uh, thanks, thanks to God that, uh, that I do have the life I have. And I'm, and I'm very thankful. And, and I thank Him every day. Amen. Uh, I wake up every morning and, and, I, and I, I pray. Uh, I forgot this morning, but I guess so. Susie Q, what are you thankful for? Um, let's see. Oh, I'm thankful that I heard from Nicole when she got back to New Mexico. She found a. Uh, she thought she had a kick plate. It was like, oh, my goals my type thing. And she went to the hospital and they did some blood work and gave her antibiotics and some cream to put on it. She got the results back yesterday and there. And it's not Lyme disease. She already had it once about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. and she, she was a little concerned about it. Yeah. I'm thankful that it was negative. Yes. Okay. Amen. Sylvia, do you have something you'd like to thank the Lord for? Just Life in general? Life. Life in general? Life in general. That's right. Um, I thank the Lord that He's. Uh, me of the story <clears throat> with uh, this guy that was you know how women are better at some things than men well, and, and right that's <laughs> obvious <laughs> and maybe most and uh, men have a hard time with uh, duties that are traditionally women duties and this guy an old-fashioned guy and, and uh, he was gonna his wife wanted him to help more around the house and he was gonna do some vacuuming and he said, he got all frustrated. I can't get this thing to start. And because his wife's wondering what's the matter with him. The wife hasn't evacuated. And he's, he goes, well, this thing's no good. It won't work. And she said, well, show me what you're doing. 
So he brings out the vacuum cleaner and he grabs onto the cord. <laughs> you gotta do that on camera. <laughs> oh, I hope they saw that. <laughs> so, but, uh, what's your name again? <laughs> Rebecca. Brenda Jr. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was thankful when I was spending some time with the Lord this week and reading some scriptures that Excuse me. he chose to include the faults of his <coughs> most notable characters in the Bible as well as their good parts because it reminds me that there's going to be failures in my life that I might never overcome never in this life. But he didn't just write the positive things about his people or his chosen people. He included some of their major fa failures. I, I was in Samuel um, the last week or so, and his sons were not acceptable. His you know, Samuel, and Samuel was was you know chosen from birth basically to serve God, and he and he still had failure in his life. Yeah. That's not what we focus on, but it's a good reminder. I was thinking a lot about what Sylvia said this week and or last week about you know when we don't feel worthy and whatnot, and, and for some of the reasons why. But I'm often actually comforted that even the most righteous people in the Bible were far from perfect. Right. And um, David and others, and I'm very thankful for that, mm -hmm. to remind me that it's, it's okay to fall on my face sometimes. Mm -hmm. As long as we let the Lord pick us back up. Right. We don't want to stay there. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize uh, no matter how far we fall, the Lord can still pick us up. And that has happened over and over. And God left, you're, you're right, I believe God left those in there for us to be encouraged and not ever get to the point where we think it's useless or it's hopeless. <clears throat> I'm no good, God can't do it. Yes, he can. We can't do it. Is that why I'm perfect? Maybe. <laughs> just, just don't have my wife. <laughs> well, it's Maybe. a strange thing to be encouraged by, but I just found some, I found him speaking to me this week about something to that effect, and it just, it was encouraging to know It's that. funny because I was reading in Samuel 2 this week, okay. and uh, Susan's brother, who might be joining us shortly, I hope, was telling us about uh, a girl that her, her sister died very young, unexpectedly, a to brain tumor. And when she went to see her mom, uh, years later, her mom was in the nursing home, and the adult daughter goes to see her mom, and she said three times, uh, she felt like the Lord was telling her, uh, tapped her on the shoulder, actually felt a tap, and said, say something about, what's the girl's name? Lori. Lori, Lori. the one that she had lost as a young girl. And each time, each first two times, she never said anything. Third time, she did. And then that third time was just before the mom passed away. And we were talking about how the Lord can speak to you uh, like that. Mm -hmm. And when I read in Samuel, God spoke in Samuel's ear and said, the day before, and said, anoint uh, David to be king. And, and he, let's see, how did he say it? He said he, he spoke to him in his ear as he was on, on the way. Yeah. And that, that, that was neat, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm thankful that God gave us a safe trip down to North Carolina to see John's sister. Mm -hmm. um, and she has, we, did, we didn't realize how bad she was. Mm -hmm. But she has dementia. But she did know us, and so we had a good visit with her. And I just kind of hated that we were standing there. I just felt so bad. Yeah. But um, at least you got to see her, and, and see it was a good visit. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Brother John. Uh, well, one was to uh, be able to see my sister. Mm -hmm. I know probably she won't remember that we were there. Mm -hmm. no. And uh, I guess my other one was when I was on the trip, I gained six pounds. Is that good or bad? <laughs> Not good. But the good part coming, I'm back to my lowest 
uh, point, I'm almost uh, lost 25 pounds. Now. Okay. Yeah. That's That's good. Woo. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sister Carol. Um, really everything. And I was thinking of Rebecca's kind of words of praise. And I read too, he uses weak people <laughs> for his glory. And that makes me feel a whole lot better. So me too. It's we funny how most of us kind of say <coughs> the same thing. Yeah. Uh, unity. Unity. unity in the spirit. Uh, but that's another good point. When we're feeling weak, remember, that's when God can use us. When we are weak, he is strong. strong. So he wants us to be weak at times so that he will make us strong anytime we think we stand in our own strength we're on thin ice so if you think you stand beware lest you fall because that's what happens and that's what happened in those examples those people felt strong and then the devil attacks and they gave in and fell and that happens to us, so we have to be careful. But when we recognize we're weak, don't think, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. Well, yes, you can. The Lord will do it through you. Uh, Brother Leonard. Well, uh, once again, I, uh, I find my blessings in my grandchildren. Uh, that the Lord has blessed me with them, but also uh, just the fact that I feel the charge on my life to raise them word and his love and in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Amen. So. That's good. Sister Rebecca. I mean Brenda. <laughs> oh, so many things. Again, grandchildren, but um I was I'm, I wanna say I'm thankful for James and Joanne and others that helped with VBS this Friday. There was like what, ten? Ah, yeah. Ten kids Lord. down We prayed two. for more yeah. kids. We were only two the yeah. before, so. And I was able to you bring two me. out of two of my grandchildren. <laughs> and um, they had a good time, and it was fun, and I'm thankful for them, yeah. for you guys, um, for the work you put into it. In I sat there, I did nothing. But you were here. Okay. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm thankful for that. Amen. Yeah. Joanne. Well, she kind of stole mine away, but oh, yeah, she did. I, I was I'm say, thinking you, Joanne. I was thankful for the fact that we did go up from from two. You know yeah. that we had more kids. Yeah. Five-fold increase. That was mm -hmm. yeah, good. That was great, yeah. Better advertisement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's good. As um, as I was getting ready to come, I saw your daughter posted. Oh, we were going to come to VBS, but I just remembered Bella's going camping with her cousin, and I thought, oh, we're down to one again. <laughs> Maybe two. And I thought, oh, do I even need to go? And then I heard some of this little voice, you know, I don't know who it was, that said, you said you'd be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I came, and then to my surprise, it was loaded with kids with mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. and great. It was great. great. It was fun. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, but I didn't do anything. We're going to be, oh, you did too, I'm sure. It's here. <laughs> Age 78 in the middle. Uh, but let's go to prayer first. What do we need to pray about? Brother Steve and I are heading to uh, Colorado, Lord willing, in the morning. For hunting? No, we want for revival services, but we want to help uh, the, the camp. Where we do go hunting, they've turned the ranch into a, a Christian center. And they have revival services in the summer there. So we, we want to go out and do some work for him and attend the services. So, so we could pray uh, for safe travels. That would be nice. Yes. Um, what else? Well, Abby and her friends that she's traveling with are on their last leg of their journey home today from North Carolina. So yeah. pray for them. I they forgot who Abby is. is. She went Here to North Carolina. Ooh. Erica, Chris's daughter. Oh, okay. Rick and Marilyn's granddaughter. Okay. She went to North Carolina with her best friend and their family. 
and they're on their way. They spent the night in Pennsylvania last night and they're heading home today. So just oh, that they okay. finish their trip safely. It's been so long since we've seen her. She used to come here all the yeah, time, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's remember Abby. And, and Pray for and, my, um, again, my son's father. Um, so he refuses to take pain meds for his injuries. Remember, he broke all of, on his left side. I keep saying right, but on his left side, he broke all of his ribs and his scapula. And he's afraid he'll get addicted. And he, so he wouldn't take anything they offered. And you know, they are pretty creative now with the types of meds they could give you. His pain is a 10 out of 10. Oh, wow. And so he, everybody was at work. Even I was 17 year old was at work. And it was just the two kids home, the 10 and the 11 year old. And uh, they're very mature and they were there. And he came into them from outside work. He has a, a camper outside. And he said, will you guys call 911? I, I'm in too much pain. I, I feel like I'm going to die. So the oldest one calls, blah, blah, blah. One of the questions they ask her is, how old is he? She goes, oh, I forgot. And the little one, she's 10, she yells out to the phone, he's closer to 100 than <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine so the 911 sure people? people who work that day had a crack on. I'm sure they do. That's Peyton. Closer <laughs> to 100 <laughs> than the zero. He's only 68, for oh. Pete's sake. He's way not But he's closer to 100. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But anyway, he's, uh, he's home, he's on some meds. She calls him a disturbance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of. She's just talking about you. No! He puts in 80 to 100 hours each week. That's and then in October everything just slips right down, and he's barely making 40. So he, well. he can't stay home and take care of him. But anyway, that's and, my and what's his first name? Michael. Michael. Okay. So we're yes. just taking prayer requests. Okay. Good to see you, Gail. I'm sorry to be so late. Oh, that's fine. I was like better late than never. Last minute decision. All right. I'm glad it was a good one. Yeah. Any other prayer needs? Um, just my mom. She's dealing with health issues, and everything is slow up there because you know free health care is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. she's she's had fluid on her shoulder, and she's gone for shots and everything. They've drained it and everything, but then like this last time, all of a sudden yesterday, like her whole arm is black because mm. it's draining because she's on you know like, blood thinners and everything too for her heart, of course. Yeah. I mean, scary nonetheless. Nothing serious, but. Waiting for the specialist so she can, you know, okay. hopefully get some relief. And her first name? Diana. Diana? So are you saying that socialized care isn't that good? <laughs> yeah, you put it on the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You get what That's you right. pay for. Good morning, Brother James. That's fine. More the merrier. Sister Brenda, you're getting all these somewhat? You sure it's Brenda? No, not yet. <laughs> I'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for all of those that are gathered here today. We ask that you um, be here amongst us. Lord, bring the Holy Spirit in. Um, open our hearts and minds to uh, your word today and the words of this book. Lord, we lift up those requests that have been spoken today um, for those are suffering in their health um, and Lord I ask that you would touch each one Lord bring healing bring relief from pain um, Lord uh, be with doctors to give correct diagnosis Lord and just um, guide them in, in their spiritual walk Lord we lift these things in your name and we ask that you would be with Paul as he leads today in Jesus name Amen Amen. Thank you. Okay, who knows how to activate? Joanne does. We got our video back, so we want to watch that first, and then we'll be going to uh, page 78 in the middle. Anybody else need a book? Hi, I'm David.
Welcome to Way, Truth, Life. We are in session five of our seven-week study of discipleship as a journey of grace. In the last session, we discussed the nature of sin and the damaging effect sin has on our world and in our lives. But what is the origin of sin? The Bible says sin originates from our inborn nature. Paul writes to the Ephesian church, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. Throughout his New Testament letters, Paul explicitly teaches that human beings are born with a disobedient and sinful nature. We do not learn to sin. Nobody has to teach us to sin. There is no Sinner 101 class to attend. It comes naturally, and we are quite good at it. Jesus said, for out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. The heart is the source that defiles. Sin comes from the heart of people. You see a small child, barely old enough to walk. Why do they act the way they do? Why are they so selfish? Why do they throw a temper tantrum when they don't get their way? A child is not a sinner because of their upbringing. They haven't lived long enough for their examples to affect them to that degree. A child is a sinner because sin comes from the heart. It is inbred. They don't have to be taught to be selfish. They do it naturally. Sin on display is an expression of what is already on the inside of a person. King David confessed this. Indeed, I was born guilty, he said, a sinner when my mother conceived me. It is the empirical fact of original sin. What does this look like theologically? Every person is created in the image of God, and God is holy and good. As originally created, humanity reflected the divine nature. But the source of holiness and goodness was not inherently from us. It was derived from God. Another way to say it is that essentially humanity is good because we are made for God, but existentially we are sinful, alienated from the life of God by our choices. Essentially good, existentially rebellious. This is original sin. We have a nature that we are born with. It's not a thing in us needing to be removed like a bad gallbladder. It is our disposition toward pride and self-centeredness. It is our inborn tendency toward violence, ego, self-sufficiency, and self-preservation. It is narcissism of the highest order. We have more than a bad record. We have a fallen nature. And God's grace is needed to provide deliverance from and healing of the condition of sin and the acts of sin, original and actual. For this, we need both justification and sanctification. We need to be reformed and given a radical renovation of our hearts. We must be forgiven of our sins, made alive in Christ, and have our hearts purified by faith. The result is a recovery of the full image of God that was lost. I have come to believe that the wrong question to ask about the health of the church is, how many people are attending? The better question, or at least moving in the right direction, is to ask, what are these people like? Because when someone becomes a Christian, the goal for them is not only to learn how to follow Christ, but actually to live Christ-like lives. This is the goal of all discipleship on the journey of grace. The act or process of becoming like Jesus is sanctification, and it is made possible by sanctifying grace. In the Greek language, sanctification is related to the word holy or hagios. The good news of the gospel is not only that we will go to heaven when we die, but that the offer of abundant life in God's kingdom is for now right where we are. God's plan is that his image in us that was marred by the fall should be restored to all of its beauty and glory, that we would become his masterpiece, reflecting Christ's likeness in what we think, in what we say, 
and what we do. That is called sanctification. And that is what we are becoming. It's not optional for a growing Christian. When a person buys a car, they're informed by the salesperson that there is standard equipment and there are optional accessories. They know that they're going to get a steering wheel, seat belts, and rear view mirrors because that is standard equipment. Every car has them. However, if they want automatic windows, alloy wheels, and a sunroof, they have to ask for it. Why? Because those are optional accessories. Not every car has them. Sanctification is not an optional accessory for a disciple of Jesus. It is standard equipment for every model. Becoming like Jesus is expected because growth is not an option. We are always growing towards something. We're always in the process of being spiritually formed. Again, Paul affirms this in Romans 12 when he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Conformed or transformed. Those are our only two alternatives. If we're not being transformed or changed from the inside out by the renewing power of God, then we are being conformed. We're being shaped and molded by the forces opposed to God that are loose in the world. The question is not if you are going to be spiritually formed. The question is, will what form you? If God is not forming us, there is a spiritual enemy. There's an adversary. The evil one who is perfectly happy to configure our lives. Simply put, the world apart from God deforms and malforms people. God reforms and transforms. That's why sanctification or becoming like Jesus is so important. So how does discipleship happen? Do we automatically begin to grow in our spiritual life after our salvation? When someone becomes a Christian, is there an immediate, in-depth change of habits and attitudes and character formation? Do Christians grow by time alone and willpower alone? Because our relationship with God is personal, are disciples of Jesus better off working solo? Well, let's start to answer the questions with this truth. Disciples of Jesus are born and made. Saving grace changes our relational status with God, our eternal destiny, and introduces the power and work of the Holy Spirit in our life. But as we see from New Testament teachings as a new Christian, we are not yet mature in our character. Being a Christian does not automatically translate into becoming like Christ. Development is needed. Virtue is grown over time through specific practices. In light of these realities, let's consider a biblical framework of how spiritual growth takes place through sanctifying grace. One, spiritual growth begins at salvation, but we continue to grow in grace throughout our lives. There is a difference between sanctification and entire sanctification. The debate always seems to be whether sanctification is instantaneous or gradual. Is there a crisis moment or is it a process? The answer is both. Sanctifying grace begins the moment we experience saving grace. But that is followed by spiritual growth in grace until, in a moment of full consecration and complete surrender on our part, God purifies and cleanses our heart. This is an experience referred to as entire sanctification. However, even following that moment of full consecration to God, we continue to grow in grace, and we never stop growing as long as we live. When we respond in faith to seeking grace, we receive saving grace. There's a radical reorientation of our priorities, a reconstituting of our desires, and the power and work of the Holy Spirit is set loose in our life. But rather than an instant liberation from every harmful habit, character flaw, or bad disposition we've ever possessed, God continues to work in us to shape us into what he wants us to be. The goal of all discipleship that is Christian is becoming more and more like Jesus. 
That's why the Apostle Paul reminds us, just we don't expect babies to remain babies. Just as we want them to grow and mature into fully functioning adults, we should also expect that we don't stay spiritual babies either. Spiritual growth begins at salvation, but we continue to grow in grace through our whole lives. We should look and act and think more like Christ next year than we do today. And so we progress by sanctifying grace. Two, spiritual growth involves more than just time. Most of my friends don't know that I can play the piano. I've been playing the piano for over 40 years now. When I was 10, I practiced almost every day with a lot of supervision from my mother, who prioritized piano practice over football. Now I play with much less frequency. I only play about once a year. If someone were to ask me how long I played the piano, I would tell them four decades. The problem is, I haven't been intentional about practicing. There are children at church who have only played the piano for a few years who can play better than I can, even though I have been playing the piano much longer. It's no different with our spiritual lives. Simply being exposed to information doesn't mean that people absorb it and understand it and embrace it and live it. While it is true that spiritual growth takes time, it is not true that sanctifying grace is merely a product of time or even a byproduct of mere exposure to Christian culture. Churches are full of people who have spent years as Christians, yet their lives reflect very little of the spirit of Jesus. They're critical and cranky, cynical and negative and selfish. The reason is very simple, and this is number three. Spiritual growth is not so much a question of time as it is cooperation with God and intentional training. The writer to the Hebrews says that some Christians who should be eating spiritual meat are still drinking baby milk. And the reason that is given is that they haven't been trained by practice to distinguish between good from evil. Therefore, Hebrews says, let us go on to perfection and leave behind the elementary teachings about the Christian life. The path to eating a grown-up diet and becoming a mature Christian is through training in righteousness. Training that helps us to recognize the difference between right and wrong and distinguish between even good and better. That phrase, trained by practice, is intriguing. It simply implies intentional effort and that Christians participate in our spiritual growth in Christ. This is accomplished through specific practices, or what we sometimes call means of grace, such as prayer, reading the scriptures, fasting, attending worship, participating in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. We'll talk more about that later, but we must be careful not to confuse participation with control. We do not control our spiritual growth or even cause it. There are some things within our control. We can make a phone call, we can wash our clothes, we can run an errand. There are also things about which we can do nothing. <clears throat> we cannot change the weather. We cannot change our genetics. There are things we can control and those we cannot. Both exist. However, there is a third category. The things we do not control, but that we can cooperate with. For example, think about sleep. If you've ever had children, you know that there comes a point where you have to tell them, go to sleep. Sometimes they'll respond by saying, I can't go to sleep. And they're partially right. They cannot make themselves go to sleep in the same way that you can make a phone call. As parents, we assure our kids they can do some things to open themselves to sleep. They can help prepare for sleep. They can lay down on a soft bed. They can turn out the lights and close their eyes and listen to soft music. And sleep will come. They cannot control it, but they're not helpless either. They can open themselves up to it and sleep quietly sneaks up on them. The same is true of spiritual growth. We cannot sanctify ourselves or make ourselves like Jesus. The Holy One is the one who makes us holy. God is our sanctifier. But as in our salvation, cooperation is necessary. 
We do not save ourselves, but we must say yes to saving grace. Eminent discipleship teacher Dallas Willard, he famously said, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. We cooperate with the act of grace of God by reordering our lives around those activities, disciplines, and practices that were modeled by Jesus Christ. And we participate in them not to earn our sanctification, but in order to accomplish through training what we cannot now do by trying harder. And number four, spiritual growth is a communal effort. One of the most surprising aspects of Paul's description of the journey of grace is that we cannot travel the road alone. Accountability, encouragement, admonition, intercessory prayer, and support are impossible apart from other people. We become a holy people together. We hear the voice of God most clearly in community. Love is superficial until it is lived out in the context of real relationships. The journey of grace is a team event. So here's the holiness equation. Sanctifying grace plus cooperation with God plus Christian community equals Christ-likeness. Christians are called to grow in grace, which is another way to say that we are to grow into the likeness of Jesus. We receive new life from Christ so that we can grow up in Christ. God remakes, God remodels. It is sanctifying grace. God not only saves us, he transforms us. He accepts us where we are, but loves us enough not to leave us there. He reimagines, remakes, and remodels us. When we offer ourselves in complete consecration, and full surrender to God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, cleanses and purifies our hearts, remaking us into the image of God the Son. We become Christ-like in our thoughts, our words, and deeds. Not a corner of our life is shut off from the control of Jesus Christ. And we take our hands off the steering wheel, and we let Jesus call the shots and give the orders. We say, you have been my Savior, salvation, now I bow my knee and I make you my Lord, sanctification. We are set apart for a holy purpose and God's perfect love begins to flow through us. We begin to love God truly with all our heart and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. This is sanctifying grace. Join us next session to discover more about the next aspect of our journey of grace, sustaining grace. Okay, what spoke to you? What did you think about it? No right or wrong answer. Anything jump out at you, what he said? Brenda, I know what you were thinking. Yeah, that, those two words are confusing to me. It, I can't even pronounce it. It's existential, existential. meaning outside. Yeah, outside. And uh, the other one was essential. 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 Yeah, essentially. In other words, we're we're made with some some uh, attributes of God. Everyone's made in God's image, so there is good in everyone. But the X's, X's, Existential. yeah, is what comes out, what's on the outside. And that's rebellion, is our natural man, if it's not uh, changed by God. So we're t dealing with how do we get back to where God wants us to be. When he formed us in, in Adam and Eve, they were perfect. And then they fell and everything went to pieces. Now God is trying to get us back into that relationship with him 
that he intended all along. And so this idea of sanctification is taking us from being saved and still rebellious to getting rid of that rebellious spirit and cooperating with God and what he wants to do in our lives to give us abundant life and give us a right relationship with him that is more than we had when we first got saved. He didn't want to just save us and keep us there with all that rebellion lurking in there. He wants us to go on to sanctification, go on to a, a right relationship with God that deals with what's going on inside. Uh, he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. Right. right. Or rebellious, mm -hmm. which we still are when we get saved. We're not, we've got a long ways to go. And when, when we get sanctified, we still got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and that'll happen until we die. Mm -hmm. But God wants us to go further. He wants us to deal with what's on the inside. Because our hearts are born in sin. And they're desperately wicked. So God needs to clean up our hearts. Do something with them. Mm -hmm. what, are, what did he emphasize? Uh, what did you pick up on that he was emphasizing about this process? Or this event? Spiritual growth. Yes. It's about growing in Christ. And, and what was the key word that he used about how we have that growth? He talked about if we don't do anything, we'll be conformed by the world. You know, that's a natural event that will happen to us. It's like uh, people say, uh, if you don't teach your kids, somebody else will. Right? Who's the somebody else? The world. The world. TV, media, friends, peers, they all affect our kids. That's why it's so important for us to be the teachers if we want them to learn what's right. Because mm -hmm. naturally, they won't. So he was talking about uh, we are either conformed mm -hmm. or Transform. we're transformed. Mm -hmm. Made new, uh, different. And how does, what's the, one of the key factors for us in order to be transformed? Cooperation. That's it. We have to be cooperative. We have to have cooperation. Uh, did you pick up on that idea that it's not just a matter of time? Mm -hmm. You know, because some people come to church for 40 years and hardly any change. Right. Might even go the other way. Have you ever known a, an older saint who seems to be pretty grumpy all the time? Yeah, Sorry. I mean, sometimes they can do that way. I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> but, but they can be that way. They can get that way. And I think it's because along the way, their growth stopped. How can you have a baby Christian when you've been a Christian for 40 years? You must have stopped. I think they think they've arrived. What, why would make them think that? I'm not sure. Or when does that happen, that they, they think they have arrived? When they get old. <laughs> no, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. We used to have Bible studies with my grandparents years mm -hmm. ago. And um, I remember my grandmother always said, you know, and she was, you know, in her 70s, I think, at the time. And she said, um... I may be old, but I'm still learning, you yeah. know, and yeah. she admitted that. And I always thought, oh, I thought she knew everything. <laughs> you know, as a kid, you think, you know, but we are, no matter how old we are, yeah. we still learn. And that's how it should be. We Absolutely. should always be seeking to learn yes. and grow. It seems maybe like a, a more of a self-righteous thing. You've been saved, you're there, you already know better. You, mm -hmm. you maybe get a mindset to where you already say it. You're already there. You know your Bible. You go to church. You should be basically. I went to the altar 25 years ago. What do I need to go back for? Right. I read my Bible every year. So. Yeah. Every year, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 Yeah. Right.
Probably. Or not as bad as some. Right. Yeah. 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 I think it's when, when you uh, change your attitude. You know, when, it, when your attitude is more loving and caring and, you know, it, I mean, you're not there, but at least you're, you're on your way. Because well, you know? it's not just knowing your Bible. Yeah. It's, it's living it. it. Yes. It's living and it. And understanding it. Right. Right. You can memorize all the verses you want, but if you can't understand the you know, God's word and you can't apply it to your life, well I mean, because sadly I've known people that knew their Bible. They knew it here. But they didn't but not here. Not here. They didn't they didn't live it. You would look you said they would tell you all the stuff they knew. But yet, they weren't showing that. They didn't show that they knew it. They weren't living it. They had the knowledge, but that was it. They had the knowledge. They didn't have the. They didn't implement. It, it wasn't. It wasn't in them. They weren't. Yeah, they weren't. That lack of cooperation. Yeah, yeah. Cooperation. it comes back yeah. to cooperation. Power, not cooperation with the spirit to mm-hmm. apply. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Allow yourself to be guided and led. Well, that's, I'm just surrender, right? Surrender yeah. to God. Like, oh, yeah, James was saying. There's a good word. Surrender. surrender. That's a hard word, yeah. too. Yes, yes it is. is. We don't want to acknowledge that we're accountable to something other than our own selves and what we deem as good for us. Mm-hmm. How do we surrender? Or what does that mean, to surrender? To give it completely to Him, everything, all of it, all of you, all of your problems. <laughs> So what's that look like in real life? Yeah. To me, it means <laughs> oh, yes. giving up what the world calls your rights. We, we often use that phrase, well, I have a right to da-da-da. And, but God never said we had any rights. Um, and so giving up your right to run your own life the way you see fit is a real uh, difficult thing to do because... You can do really good for a while, and you get caught back in it. Do really good for a while, and then get caught back in it. And I'm a living example of that. And uh, I know that being a Christian and walking the spiritual life and learning and growing is a, it's like a learning curve. We all had a student who just can't get math. It's a learning curve. You gotta go over it and over and over it before you can go on to the next area. Maybe there's another <laughs> subject that they're different have a hard time and it's same for Christians we have a learning curve mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there are certain areas in my life that I have been extremely faithful in big deal because there are certain areas in my life I have not been faithful in. and so and I, I give myself grace because I ask God to forgive me when I screw up and I ask him to show me how to do better mm-hmm. and I'm not saying I'm anywhere near remotely arrived anywhere. I'm just alive. But I think that we need to give grace to people that we think aren't living how we think they should be living as well because we don't know what goes on in their bedroom on their knees at night. Maybe they're asking God for things for their life that we don't even know about. That Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. it, so tell me a little more about how we can surrender. So I'm going to step back to when uh, Rebecca was talking about uh, feeling unworthy earlier. Um, I actually think in some ways that's a safe place to be because we aren't worthy. Right. So if we if we are there where we don't feel worthy, I think it's a growing moment for us mm-hmm. where we can evaluate our life and what God wants us to be doing and why are we not feeling worthy there's obviously something that we've done or mm-hmm. we're doing that we need to prune or let God prune from our life so well when are we worthy when are we ever well, worthy well we're justified because of Jesus that's the difference yeah. yes we're, we're worthy in God's eyes when yes. you've been covered by the blood. But I think I think in, in a lot of ways we're it's dangerous when we feel like we are worthy. Right. We need to be at that point. <clears throat> we're at the foot of the cross and that Christ is putting that stuff on our heart. Okay. 
Because if we don't recognize those things that he's trying to prune from us, we'll never get rid of them. Right. So we're only worthy when we consider the blood has covered us for our sins. Right. Take that out of the picture. When are we worthy? We're not. Uh, never. Never. So undeserving. Never. <laughs> worthy. Okay. So now I've been made righteous in God's eyes because of Jesus' death and my repentance. Notice there's always my part and God's part. It's never uh, just God does it and I'm done. I got saved. Don't bother me again. It doesn't work. There's always two parts. Um, but once we recognize that, now we recognize on my own, I'm not worthy. But God has promised me abundant life. He's promised me a new life, eternal life. And I want the blessings that God has promised me. He wants to give them to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to earn them. But he wants to give them to me. How do I get them? Surrender. Mm -hmm. When I get to the point where I can say, Lord, I know I prayed I wanted you to be my savior and my master. I want to give you my life. Now I have to get to the point where I will do it. When are some of those things that come up that require us to surrender? Obedience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Obedience to God, His Word, and His okay. Spirit. So when I'm feeling that I want to do this, but His Word says do this, I have a choice. Now I cooperate with the Word, or I don't. Mm -hmm. When I cooperate with the word, now I'm living it out. Now I'm conforming, I'm cooperating and being transformed. So it's always going to come down to, do I surrender what I feel like doing or what I want to do? Or do I hang on to what I want to do and just do it myself? We continually go back and forth. That's why it says, uh, Take up your cross daily and follow me. We have to surrender daily. We can't say, well, I surrendered at the altar 25 years ago. Now I never have to surrender again. No. Oh. When I get up in the morning, thank you. Thank you. Where's Calvin? <laughs> thank you for waking me up. Lord, let me walk with you today. Help me to cooperate with you today. And there'll be times where we don't want to cooperate. You know? Like on a rainy Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to bed. Yeah. You know? yeah. or, well, let's not get up. <laughs> yeah, we're going to think that. Or how about on a sunny afternoon when, when uh, I have a, somebody inviting me to go golfing. Yeah. Or out on a boat. Or, well... Uh, I'm going to be late for the picnic if I go to church. <laughs> you know? We can go to Alton after church. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's, we've got to answer for ourselves. Am I surrendering to what you want, Lord, or not? Uh, when I was home for a long, long number of months during the early parts of the pandemic, I thought what I was doing at home was perfectly adequate. And then one day I ran across the scripture, and this is why I came back. This very scripture I read one day made me come back. And it said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And I was very convicted. And it might not do anything to anybody else, but for me, God said, get your butt back in church. <laughs> that's what he did for me, and so that's what I... The scripture that speaks to me is, uh, uh, there's one about... Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, mm -hmm. the more so as you see the day approaching. So as Jesus is getting ready to come back, the closer we get, the more we're supposed to be together, not the less. Okay. Why do you suppose that the devil is working so hard to split up our churches, mm -hmm. keep us home, keep us apart? Because mm -hmm. the Lord's coming back and, he, and the devil doesn't want us to be ready. And he attacks each of us individually the closer we get to him and the more that we answer his calls. Mm -hmm. and... When we're 
were talking earlier about uh, yep. people that know the Bible, but they don't practice the faith. We need to remind ourselves that the devil knows the Bible better, mm -hmm. than, right. mm -hmm. better than we do. And, and mm -hmm. You need to know your enemy, and that's what he's doing. Right. He knows his enemy, so he's trying to trip us up and mm -hmm. keep us off balance. Mm -hmm. There's that really great hymn, I Surrender All, which mm -hmm. I yes. wish I knew the words to right now, but I can't. I, I think that would be really good that to look beautiful. up because that fully addresses what you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I see that sure. yeah. Is that the one that says, uh, uh, is your all on the altar? Have I laid all I my all on the altar? See. Do we, we do. Oh. That's all I remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll it, it might be, uh, oh, yeah, I'll tell you one of the things that I had to surrender. Um, when I first learned about this idea of sanctification, I started questioning it and looking and praying about it and striving for it. And it seemed like the more I did that, the more God would bring things to my mind that I needed to get rid of in my life and get out. So little by little, I tried to do that. Uh, but sometimes we don't even know what we're supposed to give up. Mm -hmm. God hasn't told us yet. And, and the big thing for me was pride. Because I had been raised, uh, boys don't cry. Boys don't even kiss their dads. They shake hands. Uh, troopers are the best. Military is the best. All that pride was built into me. So, would I want to go up to the altar? Would I want to show emotions in front of people? Weakness. You know, I didn't want to do that. That was the rebellion inside me saying, no, I don't need that. I don't need to do that. Let those other people do that. And you got it. Yeah, what you is it? Go ahead. Just the verses. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender, and that goes on. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, make me savior wholly thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power, let thy blessing fall on me. Mm. All to Jesus I surrender, now I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to his name. Amen. That would be a yeah. good morning prayer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. So whatever God puts on your heart that's between you and him is what he wants us to surrender. Be willing to say, yes, Jesus, you can take it. Or, yes, I'll, I'll not do it, or whatever it is. Any other thoughts on that before our time? Yeah, I have one little thing. Sometimes it's not what we need to give up, it's what we need to start doing. Right. And uh, I've been convicted of that a lot lately. Some things that I need to do. Right. Not that I, it's sort of like giving up my free time. But uh, now that I have much, much more of it, um, it, it's about something you need to do. Now you need to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, you know. Right. One of my weaknesses, I'll just admit to everybody, because if I admit it out loud, I'll be accountable, mm -hmm. is... I'm so ashamed to say this, but I often say I'm going to do something that I don't follow through. I am the worst person in the world for that. And I have a million reasons. So I didn't feel good today. I had a headache. The car didn't start. I could tell you a thousand. I just say I'm going to do something, and then I don't do it. And I, it's something that God's working on me to be a person of my word. Just keep your mouth shut and don't say you're going to do it. <laughs> or actually get out and do it. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why I came Friday night. I told Cindy I would do the other week of her. And <laughs> so another good song is God's still working on me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to remember that too. Mm -hmm. the, the key is to me is am I willing? God doesn't ask us to be perfect. He asks us to try. 
It's all about what's going on in here. Mm -hmm. Am I trying? Am I trying to surrender? Am I trying to cooperate? Am I trying to follow scripture? Or am I just following it on Sunday morning? That kind of thing. Wow, we didn't get too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Middle of 78, it's yeah. still there. Yeah. <laughs> we could probably read a few paragraphs because I wrote on here from the week before, stop over here. <laughs> and we never got that far. Let's try that a little bit. Yeah, uh, Carol, would you start with We Have a Nature? Uh -huh. We have a nature we are born with. It is not a thing in us needing to be removed like a gallbladder. It is our disposition toward pride and self-centeredness. It is our inborn tendency towards violence, ego, self-sufficiency, and self-preservation. It is narcissism of the highest order and in its most obvious form, which means sin in our hearts is more than a few indiscretions we commit in our worst moments. It is disregard of the first commandment, Exodus 23, and a failure to worship God alone. N.T. Wright reminds us just how deeply immersed we really are. The diagnosis of the human plight is not then simply that humans have broken God's moral law, offending and insulting the Creator whose image they bear, though it is true as well. This law-breaking is a symptom of a much more serious disease. Mortality is important, but it isn't the whole story. Call to responsibility and authority within and over creation, humans have turned their vocation upside down, giving worship and allegiance to forces and powers within creation itself. The name for this is idolatry. The result is slavery and final death. Okay, Brother James, you want to finish that next paragraph? We have more than a bad record. We have a fallen nature. God's grace is needed to provide deliverance from and healing of the condition of sin and the acts of sin, original and actual. For this, we need both justification and sanctification. We need to be reformed and given a radical renovation of our hearts. That is why Wesley emphasized inward and outward holiness. We must be forgiven of our sins, made alive in Christ, and have our hearts purified by faith. The result is a recovery of the full image of God that was lost. That's our goal. Get right with God mm -hmm. and, and keep on getting right. Keep on going closer, letting him form us, mm -hmm. change us until we get to go to heaven. When, then we'll be totally perfect. Mm -hmm. Until then, we just, we gotta keep going on. Keep on and keep it on. Mm -hmm. That's it's like we tell saying. our own children, keep trying. Mm -hmm. Right. We encourage them to try. We don't expect perfection because none of us are. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Any other closing thoughts before we close in prayer? You know, I had this, you're, you're talking about this thing, from, it's true that songs really do sometimes, you think about it. A while back I was feeling really discouraged because a lot of people weren't, weren't coming to church, you know. We just weren't getting the numbers and things like that, and I was kind of discouraged by it. And the song that, that came to me, literally just came to me was, um, I decided to follow Jesus. And the verse that got to me was, though none go with me, still I will follow. Right. You know, and I just kept saying it. So it's, you know what, that's the thing, I just, Keep going. I'm going to keep following. I'm going to keep going to church no matter what. Right. You know? My brother had a good uh, statement yesterday. We were out golfing. And he said something about how uh, our dad always wanted us to stand up when we shook somebody's hand and instead of just sitting there. And Joey said that that's what he does. And my sister said, is, is that what everybody does out there, you know, where he lives? He said, that I don't live my life according to what other people do. That's it. Yeah. We, don't, we don't act because of the world acts that way. We act a certain way because the Lord tells us to act a certain, certain way. Yeah, if we followed the world, we'd be in trouble. Right. <laughs> but we got to keep that in mind. Though none go with me, hey, I'm going to do I'm it. I'm going to go. Yeah. Those people that were POWs in Vietnam, 
all by themselves. And, and they talk about how they hung on to their faith. That's what we got to do no matter what. It might come down to that someday. But we're the only ones in a certain place that's living for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is given up because they're persecuted. Mm -hmm. And we didn't. But we got to stay the course no matter what. Yeah. That third part of the, where you mentioned the three things and you said community, that's very important. But we got to be prepared to go it alone if we have to. As long as we don't have to, let's come together and help each other. Okay, who wants to close in prayer? Sister Gail, so nice to have you back. Would you thank do you. that, please? Yeah. Would you close sure. us in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this time to study more of you, and we do pray that you would help us to surrender all that we personally need to surrender and speak to our hearts and minds, Lord, the work that you would want to do in us and uh, so that you can work through us to uh, help this world and in the places where we live and uh, the people that we are with. Lord, we pray your grace to be with us, to shine you forth, and we thank you for the study. Amen. Amen. Thank you.